All right, everyone. I think most people have filtered in at this point. So thank you again for joining us. And I will be starting off with just some um, introductions and overview of kind of the structure of how the session will go. So next slide, please. So just some um, access protocols right up front here at the top. We have live captioning presented by Ginger Barton and ASL interpretation is being provided by Kristen Wessels and Kinsey Williamson, who is our interpreter you see here and will be in the interpreter for the first half of the session. And these services are per, sorry, service providers are from Partners Interpreting. So if you need the captions and would like to see them like live in your Zoom window, you can use the automatic captions provided by Zoom by clicking that um, closed caption icon at the bottom of the screen. If you would like the live captioning services provided um, by Partners Interpreting, then you can actually follow the captions in a separate device or new window. And the link has been posted in the chat um, and we'll post it again a couple of times just to make sure it doesn't get lost. If you need help accessing the captions or ASL interpretation, please type a message in the Q&A so we can assist. On to our agenda for the day. And actually, I'm so sorry, I forgot to introduce myself right at the top. I was just so excited to jump right into today's presentation, but my name is Lillian Lee. I am a program officer on the organizations team here at Mass Cultural Council and also for the gaming mitigation program. To give a brief visual description, I am a white woman in my 30s with a vibrant purple bob and lavender glasses, and I use she, her pronouns. On to our agenda for the day. And just to note, this agenda slide does come with the decorative image of a piece by Shakuntalia Kulkarni. Um, it's an untitled armor set from the series of Bodies, Armor, and Cages, photo courtesy of the Peabody Essex Museum. So there will be six main sessions in our info session today. You're in session, uh, section one currently, introductions and session overview. Then we'll move on to the program overview, which will give some background and history of the operating grants for organizations program. We'll then move on to our guidelines, starting with the eligibility section, and then a bit about our application process and the different sections that are in the application. We'll also go over a timeline and some key dates. And then we will have time for questions at the end, um, as well as throughout. And next slide, please. Here is a slide with four pictures of our four original presenters. Um, these are our official agency headshots, but each presenter, when it is their turn to present, will give a brief description and introduction, as I was supposed to do at the beginning, but did a little bit late. Um, and just a note, one of our presenters, Greg, is actually out this afternoon sick, unfortunately. So we have Timothea and Christian, our colleagues at Mass Cultural Council, jumping in to help us with those questions. Our other presenters today are Sarah Glidden and Kaylin King, who are also members of the organization's team. And next slide, please. So this slide details how we'll be taking questions for the section. And just another note, this also comes with a decorative image on the slide of young people examining an exhibit at the Songus Industrial History Center, photo uh, by Meg Moore, courtesy of the Songus Industrial History Center. So we do ask for the purposes of kind of question management that everyone utilizes the Q&A feature in Zoom rather than the chat for asking questions. And you can find the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, it has two little text boxes and then Q ampersand A underneath them. And we will be pausing for questions after each of those sections listed out in the agenda. And we do ask that people that um, everyone kind of keeps their questions relevant to that section, because if you jump ahead, we may end up answering your question in the presentation itself. Um, and also we do ask for patience because again, we are down a presenter today. So we will absolutely uh, get to all of your questions and answer them. It may not be immediately though. We will also have a chance to vocally ask questions at the end of the presentation, as well as submitting them through the Q&A feature. 
And just as a note, this presentation is a supplement to the guidelines and is not a substitute for the guidelines. So we do encourage you to please read the guidelines before applying to the program. Next slide, please. So as you can see, that was the end of our first section. I will hold for any questions about kind of the structure. All right, and it looks like the two questions we had were already answered. So I'm going to kick it over to Sarah Glidden for our program overview. Terrific. Thank you so much, Lillian. Hi, my name is Sarah Glidden. And although all you see on your screen right now is a small black box, I am a middle-aged woman with dark reddish blonde hair and teal colored glasses. And I'm delighted to be here today and excited about the launch of our new Operating Grants for Organizations program. So this is a program we've been working on the development of over the last couple of years through a variety of processes, including some um, focus groups and interviews. Um, we have a program vision through this vision, through this program. We aim to support cultural organizations that celebrate, preserve, and inspire creativity and use the arts, humanities, and or interpretive sciences to support transformational change and strengthen communities. So this is now our primary funding program to support cultural organizations. Like I said, the program was designed following an evaluation of our existing funding programs for cultural organizations and as a response to the agency's racial equity plan. And it's strongly linked to the Mass Cultural Council's values as expressed in our FY24 to FY26 strategic plan. Um, the portfolio program, which had been our organization support program previously is being phased out. It's going to be phased out over the next couple of years. And we have communicated directly with the organizations that are in the portfolio grant program to tell them about that. The phasing out of the portfolio program is not the topic of today's conversation. So we're not really going to get into that. We're going to stick really to the operating grants for organizations program. What we have on this slide is um, the information, the language that describes Mass Cultural Council values and visions as expressed in our strategic plan. This information is in our guidelines. It's also in the application itself, but it is, it is premised on four major areas, creativity, public service, inclusion, and vision, the vision that Mass Cultural Council envisions a diverse and diverse creative and cultural sector that is valued as essential in the Commonwealth. Another slide to add a little visual interest to our, our webinar. This is a picture from the Huntington Theater Company's production of Fat Ham. And I uh, hope everyone got to see that. So the slide is about grant amounts and use of funds, because this is always one of the questions we get. This is unrestricted operating support. That means that your organization can spend this for any need that your organization has. You can use it to pay employees. You can pay rent. You can pay utilities. You can buy the toilet paper. You can buy program supplies. Absolutely any expense that your organization has is a legitimate expense for unrestricted operating support. This grant will be renewable for up to five years. And really the only reason it wouldn't be renewed is if you do not meet your organization's annual reporting requirements. But as always, we are subject to the allocation that comes from the state legislature to support Mass Cultural Council. And this is also controlled by our governing council, which approves our annual spending plan. Grant amounts for this program are starting at $6,000, and the maximum amount is still to be determined. We are waiting to see what the demand is and also what our budget is and how much that will allow us to support organizations. I can tell you, because I know this is another question we've gotten quite a bit, that grant awards through this program will be consistent with portfolio grant amounts. So there is no 
disadvantage or advantage to being in one program or the other, and you can only get a grant from one. So if you're an organization in the portfolio and um, you are not part of the wind down yet, you should not be applying to this program because you will not get both grants. So at this point, I'd like to pause for questions around the, the general program overview, and then we will move into eligibility. Hello, Sarah. Thank you. There are no questions on the overview. Oh, sorry. One just yep. came in. So uh, renewable for up to five years. If awarded in year one, do you reapply for subsequent years? No, you only have to fulfill. Sarah, we may have lost your audio. Um, I am happy to pick up the answer for the moment while we work on that tech issue. So um, renewable for up to five years means that if you're awarded in year one, you do not have to reapply for subsequent years, but you will have to do an annual report um, for each year of your award. Um, and in terms of question on grant amounts, is that $6,000 for each year? So the minimum grant amount is $6,000. There will be a grant range. So the grants will range from $6,000 to a maximum grant, grant amount. We don't have an estimated cap or amount for that maximum grant amount yet. As I said, it really is dependent on a number of different factors, um, but that will be, the ranges will change each year. So in year one, grants are starting at $6,000. We don't expect them to shift dramatically from year one to year two, but that minimum or that maximum range may change depending on all of the factors previously mentioned. Okay, can, it, can, can you hear me now? Yes. That's, um, that's fabulous. I don't know what happened there, um, but we're going to move on to our next topic, which is eligibility. I'm um, actually, there are a couple more questions oh, on this topic, right. so sorry. <laughs> no. Um, one is, will a match be required? There is no match required. Uh, will the maximum range or maximum amount be shared before the application due date? Probably not, because we are waiting to see what the um, full number of applications is. We also will not have our budget allocation for fiscal 25 at that point. And that kind of ties into the other one is that, is there a way to find out the maximum amount once it is determined? The grant amounts will be determined and when announcements are made, you'll be able to see the full range of the grant amounts from the minimum to the maximum. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Which is me. Hello, my name is Kaylin King. I am a program officer with the organization's team at the Mass Cultural Council. I'm a 30 something white woman with shoulder length blonde hair and a maroon top. My pronouns are she and her. Next slide eligible types of organizations. <laughs> First up on eligibility. There are two primary categories of organizations that are eligible for the operating grants for organizations program. Nonprofits, and then a group we call cultural affiliates. For this program, eligible nonprofits are independent entities with their own 501c3 status with the IRS, and they also need to be registered with the Massachusetts Secretary of the Commonwealth, either incorporated in Massachusetts or registered as a foreign corporation. Those statuses need to be up to date, so not dissolved, not revoked, at the time of the application, uh, so by June 13th. If you're not sure whether you're up to, to date on those um, reporting with those different entities, now would be a good time to check. And we can throw uh, links to do that into the chat as well. Next slide. 
The other type of eligible organizations are something that we call cultural affiliates. So cultural affiliates are what we call semi-independent programs or departments that operate under a non-cultural parent organization that encompasses a you know, diverse range of entities and a cultural affiliate might operate under a, a governmental parent organization or under another independent nonprofit that is not fully cultural, so would not be eligible to apply on its own. Next slide. To show that there's semi uh, that there's semi independent programs or departments operating under a parent organization, cultural affiliates uh, must also manage their own budget. So they have the ability to determine how to allocate their their own resources consistent with the mission and intent of that cultural affiliate entity, and they need to have at least one full time compensated administrative staff position dedicated solely to the operation of the cultural entity. Next slide. So whether an organization is applying as an independent nonprofit or a cultural affiliate entity, all applicants, all organizations need to meet the following eligibility requirements. The organization's primary mission or purpose is creating, presenting, or providing services in the arts, humanities, and or interpretive sciences. Over 50% of the organization's programmatic, not administrative, work is in Massachusetts. Programming is publicly available or intentionally serving a specific portion of the general public rather than benefiting any private individual or group. And a, a little note on that, um, a college or university providing programs to its own students or an organization that's only providing programming for its donors, members, or other limited audiences is not considered to be serving specific portions of the general public for this program. Uh, if a school has independently operating programs that are intended for the general public and meet that cultural affiliate definition, so it's for the general public rather than your own students, uh, you might be able to apply for that department as a cultural affiliate. For, for any questions about um, whether that applies to you or not, I encourage you to contact staff so we can talk about your individual circumstance. Next slide. Eligible organizations must also be able to provide required uh, financial reporting for the three most recently completed 12 month fiscal years. It's part of the application. For nonprofits, that's going to be your 990 or your 990 EZ. For cultural affiliates, that'll be your own internal reporting, uh, which needs to be broken out from your parent organization. So you'll be reporting on that independently uh, rather than sending your parent organization's 990. Uh, organizations also need to have minimum expenses of $50,000 for each of the past two fiscal years, and they need to have an access plan that illustrates compliance with or improvement towards the Americans with Disabilities Act. Next slide. Okay, last uh, couple of final notes on eligibility. An organization cannot get the Operating Grants for Organizations grant and a cultural investment portfolio grant. As Sarah has mentioned, the portfolio is being phased out. Uh, so if our FY24, which is right now, is your last year of portfolio funding, you should apply for operating grants for organizations this year. If it is any other year than FY24, you should hold off until you're up um, to reapply. And we can put uh, information in the chat. There's also information in our frequently asked questions page on our website that explains how to look up what your year is if you happen to be an organization currently in the portfolio. Uh, you can apply for operating grants for organizations and this upcoming FY25 round of the Festivals and Projects program. That's a program that has not opened yet, it will open next week. Um, and the way that'll work, the, the 
application periods are open at the same time, you can apply for both. You can only receive a grant from one. So announcements for festivals and projects will be made first. If you have also applied for operating grants from organizations, we will hold that uh, festivals and projects award until we find the outcome of your operating grants for organizations application. And let's move into the next section, which is all about the application. Do we have any questions about eligibility? Yes, we do. Um, so one of our questions is, in your guidelines, Math Cultural Council states that programs of K-12, through public, private, charter, or independent schools are typically not eligible unless they meet certain programmatic requirements. Can you just expand on what is meant by programmatic requirements there? This is, again, addressing the fact that if the program is intended for the benefit of the students of that K-12 school, that's not going to be eligible. But if it is a program that is externally facing, um, then, it, then it certainly might be eligible. And we do encourage you to contact staff to discuss your particular unusual circumstances. Um, another couple of questions. One mm -hmm. is we have 990s for 2022 and 2023. Prior to that, we operated as an unincorporated group um, via fiscal agent. Are we eligible? You are not going to be eligible in this first round of the program. But next year, when you have three years of 990s, you will be eligible if you meet the minimum requirements. And then similar question, are organizations with a fiscal sponsor that functions as a 501c3 eligible? No, an organization does have to have its own incorporation and its own 501c3 status. And can you explain kind of the difference between the cultural affiliate of a nonprofit, of a larger nonprofit, and a fiscal sponsor relationship? Sure. Um, I'd say the majority of the organizations that we have been funding through the portfolio as cultural affiliates tend to be programs of colleges and universities or social service organizations. So for example, it might be a community center that has a dedicated art program, or it might be the art museum or um, literary magazine at a college or university. So it is, it is part of the larger nonprofit organization as opposed to the, um, the larger nonprofit simply acting as its fiscal sponsor and, and extending that umbrella of their tax exempt status over the, the unincorporated organization, which does not have its own tax status yet. Great, thank you. Um, for chambers of commerces that are a 501c6 organization, would they be eligible to apply? The guidelines do state that the organization needs to be a 501c3. Um, 501c6s are typically not cultural organizations, not primarily cultural organizations. Um, so in this first round of grants, we are not looking at organizations that have a tax status other than 501c3, but um, if you want to contact staff to discuss your particular situation, we are open to the discussion and there you know, will likely be revisions to the program in future years if we determine that's necessary. Okay, and then um, a question on staffing. So there is a staffing requirement for cultural affiliates, but do nonprofit organizations have the same staffing requirement of needing full-time employees? They do not. That is specifically for the cultural affiliate. And, and really the, the reasoning here is that there are many large institutions that have a lot of cultural programs, part of the large institution, and they could easily carve up their activities into a bunch of different applicants. And what we feel is that if that large non-cultural organization believes that um, that the program th that that it is 
truly something that is they are supporting strongly through the dedicated staffing as opposed to lots of smaller programs that's a real indication that this is a program that that requires that kind of of support to exist um, i do understand we're getting some questions about our festivals and projects grants program we're going to ask you not to bring up those questions in this program in this conversation today uh, we're going to be doing another info session for the festivals and projects grants after that grant program launches and we we don't really have any information that we can share with you at this time about that program it's entirely separate so I'm just going to ask, um, put up two more frequently asked questions. Yeah. And then again, we will also have a question period at the end. So if we didn't answer your questions about eligibility right now, we will come back to them at the end. So don't worry, we will still answer the questions, but we do want to keep the program moving as well. Um, and just to kind of reiterate, for the minimum expenses, does that include staff expenses? Or can you talk about what that includes? Well, if you are an organization that has your own 501c3, it is going to be the expenses that you report on your 990. So that will be all of your programmatic and operating expenses. And then just a clarification again on staffing. Is that mm -hmm. staffing requirement one employee over 30 hours or just a total of 30 staffing hours per week spread out amongst employees? Mm -hmm. That is a, a single, a minimum of a single dedicated person. All right, and I think we are going to move on to the next um, section. But again, if we haven't answered your question on eligibility, we will come back to it at the end. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is the actual application process. And the application itself consists of six sections, an eligibility quiz, an organizational overview, application narrative, financial reporting, prioritization factors, and additional information. So the, again, we have another lovely image here, and this is Poems and Parts and Pieces of the Universe at the Essex Arts Center. Um, the eligibility pre-screen and quiz um, provide, is the, there are two purposes. One is to confirm that your organization is indeed eligible for this grant program. So we're asking you the questions that address eligibility. It also makes sure that you get the proper format of the application because the financial reporting sections are different for the cultural affiliates. And for the cultural affiliates, we do ask you a few questions about your parent organization. So we want to make sure that you get the version of the application that has that information. Now, simply because we have asked you questions to try to determine your eligibility upfront, we are also going to be confirming that. So once you have submitted your application, all of the applications will be reviewed by staff. So we'll be confirming that you are an active incorporated organization that has not been revoked, that you have your tax status and that has not been revoked or suspended either. There's an organization, an, a lovely image from Berkshire Pulse from their spring celebration showcase. And the organization overview is basic information. It is your mission and your core programming. And by core programming, we're looking to understand what your general activities are. So let's say if you were a musical organization, we are not looking to find out what the content is of your specific concerts this year. What we want to know is that you do five to six chamber music concerts per year in various locations, and you have an education program for um, for small children, that kind of information. So it, it's really evergreen in the sense that this information will still be reasonably accurate from year to year. Um, so again, we're not looking for the name of the concert that you're doing this year. What we want to know is that you do a certain number of concerts per year or whatever your particular um, genre is. The application narrative is probably the meatiest part of this application. It consists of four sections, two that are required by all applicants, and then 
a section where you choose one of two sections to respond to. So all applicants need to respond the question, to respond to the questions about how does the applicant demonstrate equitable practices and two, how does the applicant support Massachusetts artists, humanists, and scientists? And both the application and our FAQ have additional information that goes into what we mean by these things and give you some examples of, of how to think about what your organization is doing that responds to those two sections. And then you choose between one of the following sections. One, how does the applicant engage their community deeply and authentically? Or two, how does the applicant advance the cultural sector? Now, there, when you get into the application, you'll be able to see the questions for both of these sections, but there's a little drop down where you select the one that you were going to answer. There is no benefit to you answering both. We are only going to score, review and score the section that you have chosen in the drop down. So take a look at both questions. Think about how your organization exists and, and how you relate to both your community and how you relate to the, the cultural work that you do. And then think about the questions and choose the one that best responds to what your organization does. Financial reporting. This information is really used for us to gather the information that we're going to be using for grant calculations for funded applicants, and it also verifies eligibility. So if you're a 501c3 organization, you are going to upload your 990 or your 990EZ and answer a few basic questions about your finances. If you're a cultural affiliate, you will get an, a pop-up budget section in the application where you will be able to report on the information for your specific cultural affiliate program. This section is not scored. It, unless we determine from this section that you are actually not eligible for the grant program, unless that happens, this section does not impact whether or not you get funded. However, it does provide us with information about what your organization's annual expenses are. And that feeds into the calculation that we use to determine grant amounts. So for those organizations who might be familiar with our, our portfolio program, the formula will work somewhat similarly, which is that organizations, smaller organizations get smaller grants, but they are a larger percentage of the organization. For example, if you're a $50,000 organization and you get a $6,000 grant, that's about 11% of your organization's expenses. Um, to the upper range, the grant will be a very, very, very small percentage of your organization's operating expenses, um, but the dollars themselves will be larger. And this, like I said, is a mathematical formula that is used. We calculate three, a three-year average of your cash expenses. That's one of the reasons we're looking at three years of your 990s. And that feeds into a mathematical formula that also uses the, the amount of dollars that are allocated to this grant program through the Mass Cultural Council's annual spending plan. Next, prioritization factors. So this, these are um, sort of bonus points that your organization gets in particular situations. Um, we are looking um, at whether or not an organization has a past history of Mass Cultural Council funding. This does not include local cultural council grants. So grants that you've gotten from your local cultural council um, are not a part of this. We are looking at organizations that have completed the BIPOC-centered self-identification form. And we are looking at organizations that are participating in the card to culture. Um, these are not requirements for funding. They are not requirements for applying. Even if none of these apply to you, you should still be encouraged to go ahead and apply. Um, it's just that we are looking at these as some additional weighting factors. This section of the application pulls information from your organizational profile in our grants management system. So there's nothing that you need to do 
to to change these numbers or or facts that show up in the application it is pulling from your profile if you have not yet applied to either participate in the card to culture program or you haven't done the bipoc centered self identification questionnaire um, we encourage you to do that before the application deadline of June 13th, um, because we know we will um, probably get a fairly large number of new applications in this um, at this time. It is possible that we will not have completed our internal review of your information in time to update this page in the application by your application deadline. But do not worry if you submit an application to participate in either the Card to Culture or you do the BIPOC-centered self-identification questionnaire. They will be reviewed and any additional impact on your application will be included in our grant determinations. Um, if you're not familiar with the Card to Culture program, this is a program where we have partnered with other state agencies that are providing assistance to um, families with low income um, where their identification card through the um, SNAP benefits um, allows them to use that card for discounts to various cultural institutions. There's a lot more information on that program on our webpage. And then finally, we have just some general questions, additional information that we'd like to get about your organization. So we are looking at this information because we are also trying to identify what other grant programs your organization might be eligible for. We're also collecting this information so that we are prepared and well-informed as our grant programs continue to evolve. So we're just asking some pretty straightforward questions and look forward to hearing what your answers are. And I'm sure we have questions now. So let's pause for a moment and answer your questions. Just one moment to bring up some of our big ones that we have. Um, We actually still have a lot focused on eligibility um, and not as many on application. Okay. But we do have a couple on um, for the BIPOC centered self identification mm -hmm. form. If you don't qualify to be BIPOC centered, should you fill it out anyway? If you look at the questions and you honestly look at them and say, this is not my organization, then it's really not a good use of your time. If you have questions about whether or not it might apply to you, we really encourage you to give staff a call and we're happy to talk you through it. But there's no advantage or disadvantage to doing it if it really doesn't apply to your organization. And then another common question we've been getting is if an organization doesn't have 2023 taxes yet, what can they do? Can they still apply? Um, if you don't have and you're not going to have your FY23 by the June 13th application deadline, then you should supply your FY22, 21, and 20 990s. And there's actually a place in the application for you to tell us which three years you are providing. Because we know that depending on when your fiscal year ended, it really might not be likely that you're going to have your tax statements at this point. And that does not hurt you. Okay. We have a question on prioritization points. Mm -hmm. Is Mass Cultural Council funding a binary, have never received funds, have received funds, or is it a scale? And what is the look back periods? How far are you looking back for that? We are looking at the last three years. And it's it's a, a tipping point. It is not an, a binary. So even if you have been funded in the last three years, we encourage you to apply. Um, and then just a clarification. So mm -hmm. 
Does that mean that if you've received funding, you're ineligible, or does having received direct grants from Mass Cultural affect your eligibility to apply for this program? No, it does not affect your eligibility at all. It's just, um, it's our awareness of Mass Cultural Council grants as, as a limited resource and recognizing the very wide demand. So, so there is um, a small element of prioritization you know, to, to support organizations that have not received that in the past, but it is not a yes, no situation. Um, and it looks like those are the only questions specific to the application itself. We do have um, a few more questions on eligibility and things. Well, this one is kind of both eligibility and application. So this will be our last question, and then we'll move on to the next section. Again, if we have not answered your question yet, we will continue typing in answers, and we will have a larger question section at the end. So if you file a 990EZ and you mm -hmm. stay under that $50,000 a year so they don't ask for a breakdown, what do you submit? If you are under $50,000 on your 990EZ, then you are not going to meet the eligibility for this program. And to clarify, so if someone fills out a 990N, would that make them ineligible? Yes. Okay. Um, it looks like that is all we have for right now for the application. And again, we will come back at the end to answer more yeah. questions if they come up. Yeah. And again, the organizations that are filing a 990N, which means that they are under $50,000 in expenses, we strongly encourage you to be looking at the Festivals and Projects Grant Program when it opens in about a week and a half from now. So I'm going to pass this back to my colleague, Kaylin, to talk about the timeline. Hello, everybody. You can click right into the next slide. I am going to try and be quick um, because we have a lot of questions. I'm sure we wanna get back to those. So the application is open now. You can go into our grants management system, sign up for an account uh, or log into your account and complete it today if you like. Uh, we have office hours and we can also provide one-on-one -on -one support from now, uh, well, next week uh, up until the deadline which is June 13th. Uh, applicant, applicants will be notified in November 2024 uh, if they are getting a grant, and that's when uh, we'll start the contracting process as well. Uh, organizations that do receive a grant will have an annual report due in June of 2025. If there are any questions about the timeline, we can get into that now. Um, the only questions I've seen are when will we know? Um, and as it says on the key dates, announcements and notifications will be made in November of 2024. So I think I'm seeing are... I'm seeing one question here um, about whether organizations will be notified of their eligibility and that's that's going to be part of our internal process. So uh, any outcome of the program about eligibility or or not uh, would be at that November notification. And we've just had a few more come in. So what is the start date of the grant term, the grant period? It's our Fiscal year 25 for the state, which runs July 1st through June 30th. And when will funds be dispersed to the organizations if awarded? Sometime after November 2024. <laughs> it takes a little while for us to get our contracts out, uh, and then it depends on an organization's turnaround time to return back the contracting paperwork. Um, and then, I'm, 
Hi, this is Sarah. I just wanted to follow up on that question. So um, this is not a reimbursement grant. So unlike some grants where you've got to provide, you know, verification of expenses before you get your grant payment, that is not true in this case. And for grants of over $6,000, we pay out 80% of the grant once all the contract paperwork is completed and the final 20% gets paid out after you do your annual report in June. For, for grants of $6,000 and less, we pay the full amount when the contract is executed. Okay, and then we have a question on if an organization's fiscal year ends in July, do they have to do that first year report in June of 2025 still? Yes, yeah, the, the report. Um, what we're going to be looking for in June of 2025, we'd be looking for the next year of your 990s. So if in your application you gave us 2021 20, and 22, then as part of your year-end report, we'd be looking for your FY23. And then we'd be asking you some general questions about operations. We want to make sure that you haven't changed your mission or your programming from what you applied for, um, or at least not uh, unrecognizably changed it. Um, and again, a, a chance for us to gather some information from the field, but the applic the final report or the annual report is um, is a pretty straightforward process. It is not a heavy lift. Okay, and I think we can. Um probably move into the next just general question section because we have a lot of eligibility questions still. So okay. we are going to just kind of start going back through them. Okay. Um, a lot of questions have come up about, you know, how do we know what amount to apply for or mm -hmm. it, it, what is how our grant amounts calculated mm -hmm. specifically, things like that. Okay. So the grant amount, you do not request any specific amount we're going to take the information from your 990 and we are going to use that in our calculation to determine grant amounts. So you don't need to figure out what to ask for. Um, and then another question about, you know, state agencies being eligible to receive funding as an agency and how does that work since we are also a state agency? What they mean here is that the, I think it's a misunderstanding, and this is something that's common, is that the agency itself isn't able to receive that funding. It would need to be a program or department mm -hmm. as a cultural affiliate of the state agency who is purely dedicated. Their primary mission or purpose is arts, humanities, and interpretive sciences. So it, it would be that program or department that would be the applicant and not the agency itself. Um, and then just a general question on what programs are available if your organization is smaller and doesn't have 50,000 of expenses. And so that's where we have that festivals and projects grant, and that will be coming up later this month. And we also have a useful links page that has an opportunities and resources page on our website um, that has some really great information about other programs that are available. Also, hi, this is Sarah again. It's uh, also great to remember the local cultural councils. So there is money in every single city and town in Massachusetts that's available for local regranting. And the local cultural council program, it's a fabulous program. Um, amazing volunteers all over the Commonwealth who administer this for their communities. The applications for local cultural councils, and Timothea can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the applications for that will become available in September. And the application deadline is October 15th or the first business day following the 15th, if that's a holiday or a weekend. And then a question on, again, what that 50000 in operating expenses can include. Does that include debts or loans of any kind? 
again, is you're going to be looking at your 990. So if you have the, the expenses as reported on your 990 is what we will be looking at. And then some questions on the clarification of festivals and projects and this does, how does it, how, does the org choose which grant to get? Do we choose? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. These are two entirely separate application processes. And we do know that some organizations will decide to apply for both. What's going to happen is the, the festivals and projects application review process is, um, it's a faster process. So we know that we're going to have the award listing for that grant program before we will have completed the organization grant program. If your organization applied for both and you get awarded a festivals and projects grant, um, our plan is that we will notify you of this, but we will not issue your contract until the organization's grant process has completed. At that point, if you get the Operating Grant for Organizations grant, we will cancel the Festivals and Projects grant and you will get the Operating Grant instead. It's a larger grant, it's the better grant, it's a more flexible grant. Um, so at that point, we will probably be able to fund some additional Festivals and Projects applicants because you know, your organization will have taken the other, other grant opportunity. So. To be considered for both, you have to fill out both entirely separate applications. All right. Um, and then in terms of some programmatic, the 50% programmatic work, can the 50% programmatic services that benefit mass residents also benefit the public outside of the state? Just, just wrapping my brain around the question. Um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, yes. I mean, if you are doing theatrical programs or you're a museum doing exhibitions and some of your audience comes from outside of Massachusetts, that's fabulous. We love people coming to Massachusetts to support the local economy. Um, but that obviously benefits Massachusetts residents. Um, and then just a couple of clarifications. I'm seeing a lot of like, mm -hmm. what percentages will you consider? Things like that. There is no um, percentage of grant amount. Like if you, there, there's no request for a grant, it's all determined by a formula that we have detailed. And that's also detailed in our FAQs. Um, so there is not like, oh, if we ask for 50,000 and you only approve us for 25, does that mean we don't get a grant at all? There's none of that for this grant program. In many ways that, that lifts one of the burdens off of the applicant. Um, I know that I have sat there trying to calculate what is the most strategically beneficial grant amount to request, that's simply not a, a factor in this. Um, and then we did just have a lot of questions, again, asking for clarification on the difference between a fiscal sponsor and a cultural affiliate again. Okay. So a fiscal sponsor is an organization that is extending their 501c3 over the operations of another organization, usually not incorporated, and it does not have its own tax exempt status. Um, many of those fiscally sponsored organizations ultimately might want to get their own 501c3 status, but for whatever reason, they are not doing it currently. Um, their operations are not the operations of the fiscal sponsor. The fiscal sponsor is, is like I said, um, extending themselves over that unincorporated organization to give them the benefit of being able to accept tax deductible donations and um, 
and in many cases, the fiscal sponsor might be providing some administrative services. A fiscal sponsor enters into contracts on behalf of the sponsored organization um, and, and manages monies coming to them through grant programs. The cultural affiliate is not a separate organization. It is a part of the parent organization. And again, if you think about an art museum at a university as an example, that art museum is absolutely a part of that university. And the university determines whether or not the art, art museum exists. But within the context of the university, the art museum is a public facing or, or like can be a public facing um, program that has some, some measure of autonomy within the larger parent organization. But Harvard Art Museum is absolutely a part of Harvard. It is not a separate organization. Literary magazines at many of our major universities also adding great value to the cultural sector in Massachusetts, but they are absolutely part of the college or university that sponsors them. Well, sponsors is an unfortunate word. I'm saying take that away. And another common question asking for clarification. So just to clarify a statement and um, a requirement listed earlier, there is no staffing requirement for 501c3 nonprofit organizations. The minimum 30 hour a week dedicated full-time staff person only applies to cultural affiliates. And those cultural affiliates are programs and departments that operate semi-independently under a larger non-cultural parent organization. Um, and we have like the different types of those listed out on our guidelines. You can also feel free to email staff if you have any questions about if that applies to your organization or not. Um, and then we did have a question about what if your organization had very large expenses in one year because of a major capital project that can distort the Form 990 data? How would that affect your organization or grant amount? It's one of the reasons we look at a three-year average is because it evens out unusual fluctuations. But fluctuations are a normal part of doing business. So, so that is not a problem. Um, and then for 501c3 organizations that are fiscal sponsors for multiple performing arts organizations, Aha. should they apply on behalf of, or can they apply on behalf of those organizations? The organization itself may apply for its own operations. And there are questions in that financial section. I, I mentioned that there are some additional questions. One of those questions is, are you a fiscal sponsor for other organizations? And what is the total expense of the, the programs that you are a fiscal sponsor for? We will net those out of your organization's expenses. But remember, the fact that you are a fiscal sponsor is a way in which you are supporting the cultural sector. So right. we see that as a really, a, a really valuable service that fiscal sponsors provide to organizations, you know, that don't have their own 501c3 status. Okay, and um, just to clarify, if an organization is ineligible, they wouldn't find out until November. That is correct. All award decisions, both whether you have been approved or declined, will be made in November of 2024 for this grant program. Um, some easy questions, Sarah, that I'm happy to answer as oh, we go for a little bit. Um, will attendees receive notification once the video, I assume the video of this um, info session is available or should we check periodically? We are hoping to have that up within one to three business days after today's session. And the link will be available on our guidelines under the how to apply section. And same with the slide deck, a slide deck will also be the PDF of this presentation will also be available on our guidelines under that how to apply section after today's info session. Again, we ask that you give us one to three business days to get that up online. 
Um, there's also a question about, can you talk more about how the prioritization points will be allocated and what that means in practice? So you know, we are we are very um, sorry, I'm just trying to, to frame this right. So the prioritization points, the, these are aspects that Mass Cultural Council has decided um, should be considered in the grant making process. Um, there will be additional points. Think of it as extra credit on your high school chemistry exam. Um, there will be additional points that benefit the organizations that meet those categories. Um, it is not an amount that would absolutely make an organization either get funding or not get funding. It's more like a tipping point. Okay. Um, another question is, can you talk about the renewable aspect of the grant again? Sure. Um, we have every expectation that it will be renewable you know, for the full five years. But if your organization doesn't do its annual report, loses its tax exempt status, makes major changes to your mission or programming to something that bears very little resemblance to what applied, um, you know, those are situations that could influence whether or not the grant is renewable for all five years. And we do have in our guidelines, in our FAQ page, um, explanation of, of reasons for why an organization might not be renewed. If we determine, for example, that the reporting was intentionally deceptive, that could be a concern. Hey, um, and just a couple of more questions in the Q&A itself. Do you anticipate aiming for all eligible applicants to receive some level of funding from this program? I think that is, given what we are expecting as volume of applicants, that is not likely to happen. And then just a question about, do cultural sector recovery grants count as having received a grant in the past? Yes, that does count as a direct grant from Mass Cultural Council um, if it fell within those fiscal years. And so that that's automatically populated. That section is automatically populated in the application. So if you've received a direct grant in our system, the answer will automatically show up for you in the application. And then is the final year of our, if the final year of our portfolio grant is fiscal 25, should we not apply until next spring for fiscal 26? That is correct. All right. And then Sarah, if you want to go to the next slide, just so we have that up so people can see it. And then we do have um, someone with their hand raised. At this time, if you would like to raise your hand and ask a question verbally, we ask you to please use the raise hand function. And I will click allow to talk um, when it is your turn. Yeah. So. And just while we're waiting for those hands to be raised, um, if you go to the guidelines page of our website, or if you go to the um, agency dates page of the website, you will see office hours. These are small group meetings. We find that a lot of folks have the same or very similar questions. And this is a chance for small groups to talk with um, Mass Cultural Council staff and get their questions answered. If your situation is more unique, um, you might decide that you benefit from one-on-one -on -one support and you can sign up for an appointment to talk with one of us. Um, again, on our guidelines page, you'll see the Operating Grants Virtual Support Meetings, and that will sign you up for a time to talk with us. We tend to schedule these about two weeks out in advance. So if you go to our guidelines page now, you'll see opportunities to talk with us either individually or in small groups over the next two weeks. And we'll continue to refresh that with um, more opportunities for conversations.
Yes. Plus, Sorry. you're always welcome to email or call us. Just one clarifying point before I turn to Alexander for his verbal question. Um, the link for one-on-one -on -one support will be available on our guidelines page within one to three business days, just as the link to this and the link to the recording. And so I will, um, Alexander, please ask your question. Uh, yeah, so I apologize. I kind of came in late here, but I did want to ask if municipal departments with enterprise funds could apply for this. I'm not familiar with enterprise funds. So we can, instead of us using uh, the tax base, we, use, we get uh, revenue from our cable, cable company. We're an access station, but we're under the town. We're not a 5-1-C-3. Oh. Okay. If it's a department of a municipality and its primary mission is arts, humanities, or interpretive sciences, and you meet the requirements as defined in the um, cultural affiliates, you would be able to apply as a cultural affiliate. Okay. All right. That's why I thought. just want to clarify. Thank you. You're welcome. And we also have Michelle with her hand raised. Their hand raised, sorry. Hi, thank you so much, Michelle Ferguson. Um, we have a, um, a corporation, but also a fiscal um, partner while we're waiting on our 501c status. And I'm just wondering if um, there is a certain date you don't want to receive emails after in regards to this grant. I'd say if you missed June 13th, um, our information will be more helpful to you for future years, but we have people contacting us right up to the day of the deadline. Okay, thank you so much. We will do our best to be available to you. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, kind of as a follow-up to that question, because we had a similar question um, a couple times in the Q&A as well. For organizations in the process of getting their nonprofit 501c3 status, our eligibility guidelines specifically state that you have to have that active status in place as of the deadline, June 13th, 2024. If it's not in place by our deadline, then we encourage you to look back and apply next year. All right, and we'll just give it another couple of minutes or another minute or two. All right, I see. Maggie with their hand up. Um, just to know, you will need to unmute yourselves as well. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the 501c3 status, the, the last question that you answered, um, if you're only getting the status um, recently in this year, you wouldn't have three years worth of 990s, would you? That is correct. Um, I Because we're trying to start something yeah. and haven't applied yet for our 501c3. So I'm looking at what I could do in 2028 or 2029. Correct. Okay. Correct. Now, Thank if you. you're an organization that had your 501c3 status and it got revoked, but you've been doing your 990s because you didn't realize you'd been revoked, wow. you need to clear up that revocation by June 13th and Thank have the 990s. Thank you. You're welcome and good luck to you. Thanks. Right. And then we have Sonia. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's truly been very uh, informative and thank you again. Just for clarity, um, it, for in the case of a, a nonprofit with, that has the 501c3, um, but has been in existence for fewer than three years. And so obviously would not have the three years of 990s. Does that mean we also need to wait until we've got three years of 990s behind us? Thank you. That That is correct. Okay. Thank you again. And Marlon. Yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to ask that, you know, so we have 990s. We've been around for a while. We're under 50,000 as of our last 2022, 2023. We're going to go over 50,000. 
Um, I know I heard something in regards to not being over 50,000 means you're not eligible um, with the 990. And also we've put in the state, you know, like, so we do have the more detailed breakdown. It's not like we just did the postcard because we had to um, submit the same IRS information for our state taxes, right, mm -hmm. through the Farm PC. So it's not like we just have the postcards, so there's no, like, data of what we're spending or what we're doing. So given that, or do you think that we're eligible? You do have to be over 50,000 for the last two fiscal years reported. But again, we have every expectation that this program will run again next year and years after that. So please come back. So we are a bit over time. Um, and so we just have two more questions in the Q&A and then we are going to call it a day. And again, you can email us, you can call us, you can sign up for our office hours, you can look at our FAQs, et cetera, after the fact. Um, one question is, if you were a cultural affiliate initially and then became a 501c3, and so like you're in like the last year, so your cultural affiliate status and your 501c3 status total is three or more years, would you qualify? I think you are someone who should contact us to talk to us directly. It's It's not enough information really to to gauge that from this conversation. And then, yes, we will be updating the FAQ to include the questions and answers that were addressed today. So if there were a lot of the same frequently asked questions here, we will be updating the FAQs to include those questions. Um, and again, thank you all so much. I'll turn it back over to Sarah. And as Lillian said, thank you so much. We know we had a very large group today and we know there was a lot of information coming at you. We appreciate your attention and your good questions. And please reach out to us through any of those opportunities, either through the office hours, the one-on-ones, or send us an email at organizations.masscultural at mass.gov or give us a call. We look forward to being able to help you. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you to all of my presenters and our folks working behind the scene on the Q&A and the chat, and of course to our fabulous interpreters and captioning staff.